right, guys. It is at least a sunny, but still a little bit chilly. I think we're up to 43 degrees here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on May the 6th, Thursday, May the 6th, 2021. So, guys, we're getting ready to make history at Collapse Chronicles, uh, as I just explained in another video. This is going to be the very first monetized video on Collapse Chronicles, so I'm working out the kinks. Now, you can listen to my explanation in the other video I just did, but what I need you to tell me, what I'm trying to set up is that these ads you know, I, I think I have it set up where you can hit the little skip the ads after five seconds. So if that is not working uh, for whatever reason, do let me know. Uh, but I'm trying to set it up. You know, I am a bit of a Luddite. So anyway, <clears throat> moving on. Uh, we're going to, for today's Chronicle of the Collapse, I don't know the who originally wrote this, it's just showing up on Yahoo, we're going to go back about 85,000 years and we're going to talk about planet nibbling and noble savages. And this is written by a bunch of, uh, bunch of very highfalutin professors teaming up on this to tell us about planet nibbling 85,000 years ago. Uh, early humans used fire to permanently change, permanently change the landscape tens of thousands of years ago in Stone Age Africa. Where this is an article about technology, if you are not aware of this. <clears throat> Fields of rust-colored soil, spindly cassava, small farms and villages dot the landscape. Dust and smoke blur the mountains visible beyond massive Lake Malawi. Here in tropical Africa, you cannot escape the signs of human presence. How far back in time would you need to go in this place to discover an entirely natural environment? Our work has shown that it would be a very long time indeed, at least 85,000 years ago, eight times earlier than the world's first land transformations via agriculture. And uh, I have certainly been having this debate on Collapse Chronicles. You know where I place on the planet nibbling noble savage debate. Uh, these people who claim that humans, hunter-gatherers, had no effect on uh, their ecosystems, uh, that before the age of agriculture, humans lived in, uh, in balance with every other uh, species of earthling we share this planet with. I am no uh, anthropologist, but uh, I have been blowing the whistle on that one since I was about 12 years old. So who are these guys writing this, we are part of an interdisciplinary collaboration between archaeologists. I've never really understood the difference between archaeologists and anthropologists. We're part of a collaboration between archaeologists who study past human behavior, geochronologists who study the timing of landscape change, and paleo-environmental scientists who study ancient environments. By combining evidence, 
from our research specialties, we have identified an instance in the very distant past of early humans bending environments to suit their needs. In doing so, they transformed the landscape around them in ways that are still visible today. <clears throat> so this is kind of how they do this. The dry season is the best time to do archaeological field work here and finding sites is easy. Uh, talking about all the stone artifacts. I'm going to put the link on here so you can look at all of the photos and stuff. Uh, these stone artifacts are evidence that someone sat and skillfully broke stones to create edges so sharp that they can still draw blood. <clears throat> Many of these stone tools can be fit back together, reconstructing a single action by a single person from tens of thousands of years ago. Uh, so they are sifting through more than 45,000 artifacts. Uh, excavating date to a ranging from about 315,000 years ago up to 30,000 years ago, which was then known as the Middle Stone Age. <clears throat> This was also a period in Africa when innovations in human behavior and creativity pop up frequently and earlier than anywhere else in the world. We won't get into Terence McKenna's spin on that in this uh, story. <clears throat> How did these artifacts get buried? Why are there so many of them? And what were these ancient hunter-gatherers doing? Yes. And, um, so, guys, this is a, a, a long, involved uh, article, which uh, I will let you read uh, for yourself. I'm just going to hit some of the highlights uh, you know, all the way they do this. Uh, <clears throat> so they reconstructed the ancient environment uh, and looked, compared it to today, where today this region, which, you know, used to be a forest, is now characterized by bushy, fire-tolerant open woodlands that do not develop a thick and enclosed canopy. Forests that do develop these canopies, which were the ones before humans got there, harbor the richest diversity in vegetation. This ecosystem is now restricted to patches that occur at higher elevations, but these forests once stretched all the way to the lake shore. It was <clears throat> 85,000 years ago that a few humans armed with fire and stone tools uh, took down a closed canopy uh, rainforest and turned it in uh, to, to this ragged landscape uh, 85,000 years later I was just uh, having a discussion with a friend. He was talking about some quote. We were trying to figure out where the quote came from. It did not come from Derek Jensen. <clears throat> Something about how forests always precede humans and deserts are, are our legacy. I'm going to find that quote. It would have been a great quote for me to insert here how humans walk into a forest and out of a desert. Um, okay. Uh, so they just happened. So they're, they're trying to figure out the, the natural variation, you know, looking at, at, at natural climate changes 
without humans compared to uh, you know trying to figure out uh, what uh, percentage that these ancient noble savages uh, made and that that's still open to debate uh, of course what they're talking about more than stone tools is harnessing fire to uh, manage resources uh, around 85,000 years ago something strange happened around Lake Malawi charcoal production spiked erosion increased and for the first time in more than half a million years, rainfall did not bring forest recovery. And this is a story that has been repeated over and over and over again. I will refer you to the cedars of Lebanon. Lebanon uh, used to be a heavily forested country. Uh, <clears throat> yes, at the same time this charcoal burst appears uh, in the record, our sites began to show up in the archaeological record, eventually becoming so numerous <clears throat> that they formed one continuous landscape littered with stone tools. Um, as those numbers increased, more and more charcoal was washing into the lake. Early humans had begun to make their first permanent mark on the landscape. And I think, if I recall, today, to this very day in Africa, it is charcoal that is the number one form of deforestation going on in Africa. Well, the palm oil companies are going to overtake it, but I believe uh, that right up until today, if I remember Manga Bay, that charcoal production, it is <clears throat> these planet nibblers. You know, all of these people who you read who have no uh, environmental impact. It, it is cooking their food over charcoal because they can't afford fossil fuels to cook their food on. Uh, what was good, what was bad for the planet 85,000 years ago uh, is worse for the planet today because there's a lot more people uh, using charcoal. Uh, <clears throat> fire actually is a technology that stretches back at least a million years years. Using it in such a transformative way is human innovation at its most powerful. Um, you know, the <clears throat> hunter-gatherers use fire to warm themselves, cook food, and socialize, but many also deploy it as an engineering tool. Uh, based on the wide-scale and permanent transformation of vegetation, we infer that this was what these ancient hunter-gatherers were doing, is uh, using fire as an engineering tool. Uh, yep, they actually uh, have the, a new word for the collapse Pyrodiversity. Pyrodiversity. There you go. That's what we have. We have a planet of pyrodiversity. Uh, just like today, changing any part of an ecosystem has consequences everywhere else. With the loss of these closed canopy forests in ancient Malawi, the vegetation became dominated by more open woodlands that are resilient to fire but did not contain the same species diversity. Uh, also increased erosion which spread sediments into a thick blanket 
known as an alluvial fan. It sealed away archaeological sites and created the landscape you can still see today. Um, yep. And so then they try to make, then of course, like any other study, they, they try to make lemonade uh, out of these lemons and uh, trying to use this information to figure out, <clears throat> I, 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 I love the uh, unintentional irony of this oxymoron, you know, the sub chapter uh, of this next section of the article, human impacts can be sustainable. Human impacts can be sustainable. Yes. Uh, <laughs> anyway, guys, uh, this goes on and on, but anybody trying uh, to figure out uh, all right, let's move down. I'm gonna, I, I'm, we're, we're gonna read the last three paragraphs, and then I have to move on with my own unsustainable lifestyle. Okay, <clears throat> most people associate human impacts with a time after the industrial revolution, but paleo scientists have a deeper perspective. With it, researchers like us can see that wherever and whenever humans live, we must abandon the idea of pristine nature untouched by any human imprint. Uh, however, we can also see how humans shaped their environments in sustainable ways over very long periods causing ecosystem transformation without causing ecosystem collapse. And, and, and again, guys, I'm not going to go off in some philosophical rant. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I, I, anyway, I, I'm just going to shut up here. And I, I am quite sure uh, all of the, the species of earthling uh, that are now extinct, that used to live in all of those closed canopy uh, forest ecosystems, uh, would have a lot to say about that. Uh, that, that planet nibblers. Anyway, <clears throat> let's just wrap this up before I run off at the mouth here. Uh, seeing the long arc of human influence therefore gives us much to consider about not only our past but also our future. Yep. Uh, by establishing long-term ecological patterns, conservation efforts related to fire control, species protection, and human food security can be more targeted and effective uh, people living in the tropics such as Malawi today are especially vulnerable to the economic and social impacts of food insecurity brought about by climate change. Yes, by studying the deep past, we can establish connections between long-term human presence and the biodiversity that sustains it. With this knowledge, people can be better equipped to do what humans had already innovated 100,000 years ago in Africa. Manage. Manage the world around us. Oh, God, yes. Uh, I just went and spent $550 yesterday on this little... Uh, uh, on this little uh, gizmo so I can manage uh, the world around me. 
here in Bugs in a Jar Farm, uh, crank that gas sucking blade up, and I'm going to get out with my own sustainable lifestyle uh, with my new $550 chop saw on a stick and uh, manage some landscapes while I still can, and I highly suggest you get out there and start managing your own sustainable lifestyle while you still can. Speaking of charcoal, uh, I am in the market for a gas sucking uh, barbecue grill. If anybody uh, listening to this around Ithaca, New York has a gas burning, it says I don't want to use charcoal. Uh, since charcoal is destroying the planet, I am in the market for a gas grill. Please contact me here if you have a gas grill for sale around Ithaca, New York. Alright, little dog. Are you ready to uh, go manage some life, some landscape? Are you going to go fertilize some landscape while you still can? My little dog needs to go fertilize the landscape. Bye, guys.